Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the Too Talented on Offer to Onboard as part of our Summer to Evolve series. Uh, very happy to have everybody here. Um, I'm Peter Clare. I run uh, services and operations here at Jobbyte, and uh, very excited uh, today for us to uh, be speaking with Elaine and, and Chad on the very uh, apropos topic of um, uh, on the very apropos topic of onboarding and just share my video so everybody can see what I look like. So nice to meet you all um, and uh, happy to be here. So without further ado, let's uh, jump in uh, to the Summer to Evolve and, and jump into our session today. So we've got uh, 12 weeks of Summer to Evolve. There's 45 sessions. We've got uh, great content that we've been seeing amazing engagement um, ac across the, uh, the TA landscape. Uh, over the past several weeks, our five topic areas are recruiter skill sessions, uh, these two talented uh, conversations where we bring uh, true experts in uh, to share uh, and, and to spitball ideas around how to improve talent acquisition. We have our demo day uh, recruiter real talk where we, where we get into the real uh, nitty gritty and then our break room where we can all uh, get together and have some fun. Um, so when we think about the, the 12 weeks of Evolve, we've been on a, a solid, um, uh, program here. At this point, we're two thirds of the way through uh, with this session, so I'm super excited to be, um, you know, running the uh, the final leg of the race here and kicking that off uh, in in the relay here with uh, Elaine and and Chad. Um, so when we think about uh, this week in particular, um, we had our recruiter skill session, uh, basics of building programs to develop. Uh, we've got two talented today. Uh, keep in mind tomorrow there's a, a great demonstration of the job by uh, onboarding experience and capabilities uh, that is going to be shared with uh, by Michael Serino. Um, and then we've got the break room uh, with our CEO, Amon Brar and uh, Jim O'Hare from uh, Parks and Rec. And we really want to make sure that people uh, join in for that. Knowing uh, the, the characters from Parks and Rec, we know that that's going to be a super, super fun session on Friday. Um, so do please make sure that uh, you go and get registered for, for that session. Um, you can do so at the summer to evolve.com. Uh, go, go there, check frequently, and see all the great um, upcoming programming that we've got uh, to offer. So, with that, uh, let me introduce um, our panelists or speakers today um, and uh, give you a, a, a quick overview. So, um, I want to introduce Elaine Orler. Uh, Elaine has you know, over 25 years' experience. Hi, Elaine. Um, 25 years uh, experience as a practitioner and as a consultant, um, designing and implementing uh, global HR solutions for a long, long time. I would say a giant of our industry. I've known Elaine for a long time and very excited to have this conversation uh, with you, Elaine. So thank you very much for, for joining us and really looking forward to this uh, 45 minutes. Definitely looking forward to it myself. Super. And I, I missed all of the other, um, I, I did miss all of the other kind of uh, key achievements here in terms of founding the talent board, um, found their CEO of talent function. And, and I just felt like it wasn't necessary because everybody knows who you are and knows what we're getting here. So uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, also, as part of that, um, wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that people got to know the, the human side um, of Elaine and, and get an understanding of uh, kind of some of your uh, summer favorites and your tops. I'd love for you to share a little bit about those with us. Sure. Besides uh, Top Gun, and I, if, if it don't say Top Gun, it's got to be Top Gun for everything. And um, <laughs> I love the question about what your favorite ice cream truck ice cream is, because I haven't had a cream sickle in how long, and I'm now on a quest to find them again from the ice cream truck that comes down our street. <laughs> yeah, it's 11 o'clock here in Seattle, so we could potentially hear the ice cream truck going by. Uh, sometime during this call. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> You'll have to get one for me. Yeah, exactly. Super. Okay, so um, uh, next I'd love to introduce everybody to, to, oh, this is going a little crazy here. Let me get to the right screen, uh, to uh, Chad Sowash. So Chad is the host of HR's Most Dangerous Podcast, um, also known as the, the snarkiest podcast in the industry. So welcome. Uh, nice to see you, Chad. Um, uh, what, what not everybody knows is that Chad was an inf infantry drill sergeant, so he is going to keep us on task today um, and make sure that I don't uh, screw this up for everybody. So 
Um, Chad's worked with Fortune 500 companies for a lot of years, building recruiting programs specifically focused in um, on uh, veteran hiring, but obviously Chad's expertise extends well beyond just the veteran hiring. So super happy to have you here as well, Chad. And I'd love for you to share with us your uh, your key summer favorites as well. Yeah, Ghostbusters is a is a staple for for anyone. Growing up in the '80s, obviously for for us, but uh, to be able to carry it forward, I mean, Bill Murray, I mean, Aykroyd, it's yeah. just it is a classic. So Ghostbusters is always a good answer. Top Gun, always one that you've uh, you've seen probably about 20 plus times as well. Uh, the drumstick, just because as a kid I couldn't get enough chocolate, and it seemed like the the best package where I wasn't going to drop it and and lose anything. So uh, the the drumstick was easy. Uh, definitely beach. I'm looking for for beaches now that we're here in COVID, uh, and we haven't seen one in a while. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see the rest of it. I'm, I'm not into hamburgers and hot dogs too much unless it's uh, not meat. <laughs> Super. Well, uh, and again, uh, I'm, I'm Peter Clare. I run uh, customers and operations here at, at Jobbyte. I would say that I'll sit down with you guys anytime and watch both Top Gun uh, and, and uh, Ghostbusters, probably not in that order. Um, my favorite ice cream truck order is also a drumstick, and it's because the chocolate is right at the end. Um, hamburger, hot dogs, I'd say ribs, pool or beach, just get me out of this office where I've been stuck since March. Um, and we'll be back. All right. So with that, um, let us uh, go ahead and uh, dig a little deeper here into our, our topic today. So I um, want to keep it real fresh and, and uh, kind of reactionary. So I'll, I'll start with probably what is on um, everybody's mind is uh, thinking about from an onboarding perspective, um, what is your view into how this world has changed uh, in the last four months? And what of that change is going to be sustainable um, or is going to sustain, sustain itself past the end of this pandemic that we're that we're living through. And I'd love to throw that to you first, Elaine, um, to get your thoughts on uh, what's coming up, what's happening, and how long is it going to last. And I'm going to punt to Chad. No, I'm not. I'll take it first. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think about, and I thought about really kind of how to answer this question in advance because this comes up on almost every conversation we have. Is what's changed and what's going to stay, the, um, what will stay the same in this change as we go forward. And I think I came down to, we, we used to be in, and I love the concept of this being the evolve, we used to be in a stage where evolution was something that would take quite a while for us to make changes, to embrace video, to embrace technology, to get our work done, to embrace this as a way of new collaboration. And I feel like we hit a big bang this time around because now everything is video, everything is virtual, we're required to juggle um, home and work, home and work life balance. This concept of balance is completely shifted for everybody. And I think it's gonna stay this way for a while. I think organizations are already starting to demonstrate that they can adapt and still, and still be performing in this kind of environment. We've heard a lot of companies start to say that they're not expecting workforce back into the office until July of next year at the earliest. So this is a new norm. I think for me, the biggest challenge has also been Every time you do a Zoom call, you assume it's going to be camera. And long gone are the conference calls. It used to be you could do a call that didn't require video all the time, but now it's almost a mainstream that you're always going to have video on. And learning to to identify with what is video ready um, and whether it has to be professional or not, and oh, everything has to be professional. I should requalify that. But whether mm -hmm. the hair has to be completely done or it's in a ponytail, it doesn't much matter anymore. There's some of the things that I'm learning. <laughs> Yeah, that's super helpful. I've started to ask people if they can move their camera so they can show me where they hang up the good clothes that they throw on really quickly when the video is on. That's a great one. <laughs> How about you, Chad? What are your thoughts? I think I think overall we are now understand, understanding that what we did before is not sustainable and that to be able to live in this new world, especially when we start to scale up, we have to be able to scale and we can't do that with just human beings. We need to be able to actually adopt technology. And all of that technology that was out there, the AIs, the RPAs, the, the, the MLs, all that stuff that everybody loved to talk about, but didn't, they, they're really too afraid to, you know, to, to, to utilize. Um, now they want, they want to be able to, to check it out to see how they can make the experience much faster, more efficient, and just better 
for the end user. So, so as somebody in HR, not just talking about the application process, which which could you know used to suck and into you know some some extent still does for for some companies. They are starting to focus on that incoming experience, but then also the onboarding experience. Because once again, you know, ghosting or losing somebody that you spent that much time and money to, to acquire uh, is, uh, is, is not something that you can sustain, especially when we get ready to start ramping up. Yeah, I think I think the ghosting uh, topic is a really important one, right? I'm, uh, you know, we're compiling some data to see if what we can see around uh, and if there's an increase in ghosting, when in many cases now hiring is taking place without ever having met in person, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are you guys seeing or hearing from your from your clients with regards to that? Is there a general sense of there being more ghosting occurring uh, now that we're doing things in a remote environment? Um, and if so, is there any advice that you're giving them? And this is for either of you to, to answer. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I'll, I'll jump start with them. Um, I'm not really hearing as much on the ghosting part as it's a every candidate is more cautious to the next steps. Mm -hmm. It's not just about video, it's not just about the interaction, but now it's about a, making this kind of change, making a career change in this environment where security and safety are our number one priorities right now. It's making more candidates much more cautious and much more in the mindset of much more due diligence than we might have before. We might have been willing to take a little bit more of a risk or a leap, and now it's a much, much more specific approach and um, it's not as much the ghosting as it's been the at the end of the day when I do the pros and cons of making a change or a shift right now, um, the risk is too great. So I think for a short period of time, we're going to continue to see that candidates need to be encouraged and, and protected in the way in which they're brought through the offer process, brought through the onboarding process so that they feel that safety and security is really one of the primary drivers. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, and I really think that ghosting, let's talk about pre-COVID because obviously we were in an entirely different economy and ghosting was was high to some extent. Um, that is a product of, of bad user experience. And you're going to hear me talk about experience a lot because it's something that we need to work on. It's something that technology, especially today, can help us from a process uh, in a connectivity, from a connectivity standpoint. I know that uh, talking to uh, some companies and, and, and RPOs that are out there that have created technology that utilize text and messaging to be able to keep those individuals warm until they're there the first day and even beyond, so that their ghosting goes from 40% uh, in some of the high volume uh, areas to near near zero, like in, in the single digit. So I think one of the things that we're, we're really bad at as humans and definitely Americans is that we try to fix what is wrong now and we don't think long term. And from a long term standpoint, bad user experience hurts us now, but it will really hurt us when we don't have the candidate flow that we that we definitely need and when, we're, when we need them to have a great experience with our brand. Yeah, I think that uh, brings me to a, another question around the experience and when we think about you know, today's topic of, of onboarding and our offer to onboard, um, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, how does the transition work out of recruiting uh, into HR or over to the hiring manager? Uh, how does that interaction all work together if you're going to provide an optimal candidate experience um, in, in today's world across those different stakeholders? Jack, you get to go first on this one. Yay! You appreciate that. Um, I, I think overall that uh, when we're talking about like the handoffs, uh, we, we need to make sure that um, in most cases we're looking at this process, this experience um, from a branding standpoint. And I really believe that we should be bringing uh, in some cases marketing or employer brand in to be able to help us better understand the experience and the handoff points. Right. So if you're getting into, let's say, for instance, the um, the pre first day, we need to be able to understand the priorities of what needs to be completed uh, from creating tasks and goals and integrated messaging, real messaging around those goals so that we can release. Again, we're dealing with humans. We want them to have a great experience. We need to help them release that oxytocin. Right. And we know that 
completing tasks uh, helps do that. We also need to uh, not show them the elephant to overwhelm them, just the bites, right? And then to be able to, to inject engagement in that, whether it's a video from the CEO uh, or your peers during that process. And then also, I, I know Jobbyte has it within your on, onboarding suite where you can actually signal or nudge uh, a hiring manager, a peer, or somebody like that to be able to say, hey, um, Chad just finished this segment, he's going into the next segment, and it gives that it gives that real human touch. So as we talk about all of the acronyms, AI, machine learning, all that other fun stuff, we have to think about how we use that to become more human, to get rid of those tasks that really bear us down on a daily basis in the minutia, and it releases us to be more human. And uh, so I guess, you know, my answer is, you need to be able to get the stakeholders together and they have to have a common uh, goal to have a great experience from point A, the offer, offer letter, all the way through into their first day and beyond. Yeah, I, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I, I look at it from two other lenses and specifically the person that's being hired. And what is what experience are they expecting? And so often we just we craft these workflow engines to make sure tasks get done, but yet don't don't take a step back and think what if, what is this about? This is a life event change. So what is expected, or what what can we expect? And just looking internally, what would I expect if I were making this life event change? What kind of communication would I need? What are the variables that go with me? And my in my life, my lifestyle, do I have young children? Is this going to require a big lift and shift from the rest of the family? But how do all of those get proctored into this experience that I'm about to have with the organization? We do know so much about the people we're about to hire, the offers we're going to extend. We've collected this information in a way that we can project it back as feels familiar to the candidate, which creates a lot more engagement and excitement around the job then I would say the sterile, which is here's here's the checklist of answers and the process that you have to take in order to um, be an employee here. Oh, yay, thank you so much for giving me more work to do. So I think of that onboarding and, and that audience that you talked about, the those that need to be involved, um, everybody has a role to play. And I think the biggest gap in organizations today is there are people that assume somebody else is gonna play their role like the hiring manager in their division, it just assumes the recruiter and HR is gonna take on all the communication, that they don't need to be engaged until the point that the person shows up. So how do we facilitate making sure that everybody is playing their role, but in such a way that it doesn't overburden those of us that are doing the work, but then those the candidate with too much communication or just the right amount of communication and relationship. And it's a balancing act and a lot of collaboration that should be happening within the tool sets that exist. Agreed. Um, it, it, let me jump in there real quick. I think you're, let's talk about the event, Elaine. I, I think instead of thinking of it as onboarding, this is an actual event for that individual. You know, I, I think you saying that means so much because when you, you're doing anything with an event, there's an experience that happens within that event, right? So yeah, I think, I think, a mindset the event mindset has a, a lot to do with it that's that that's a great point yeah i like that a lot I, I do think that you know once you're actually a productive employee you're not spending an awful lot of time with hr or recruiting right so um when you think about that event uh, to me it just seems like the hiring managers uh, myself included when i'm uh meeting that description uh just don't spend enough time on making sure that that experience is going to be seamless from decision post interviews um all the way through to a productive and productive employee um so one thing i i will say um just uh, uh keying off of what you said there Elaine is there is a lot of those things that just have to get ticked off right mm -hmm. um and specifically some of those things are getting far more uh complex when you think about um, tax laws and where somebody's sitting, whether they're sitting, I think about areas like New York City, uh, where potentially they used to be a New York City based employee, but they're actually in New Jersey and they're working from home now. And what does that mean from a tax perspective, et cetera? Uh, how are you seeing companies reacting to this increased uh, level of um, 
you know, complex uh, tasks that are required and then balancing that against, we just need to have people have a great experience and get hired. Yeah, I would say, uh, when I think of onboarding, I always go back to there's three tenets to making onboarding successful, post the offer and the accept. Um, there's socialization, which is making sure that that engagement and that collaboration is happening on a regular basis. There's forms administration, which is some of the things we're talking about now. These have to get done. Um, we, we can't really make them as sexy as we'd like to, but they need to get done. So any place where we can um, repurpose the same information used to complete another form so that we aren't entering the same information multiple times, huge, huge value add. And there's a way to do that within systems. But in that forms administration, we get into the myopic, okay, what is the what is the tax form for this state on this geographic territory in this in this place? And many organizations haven't really automated that in, in their own version today. It's go to the file cabinet, find the right one, or go to the index that's on the website, or hope for the best because somebody's going to figure it out. There are tools that can help um, facilitate this, but having every single one in the system at the exact moment in time, I think, is, is not practical. But I do think allowing for those that have access to that to make sure that they can get those in just in time. So when all those variables come up and it doesn't fit a perfect perfect channel, it's in New York City, New York tax law, simple, simple step, um, it falls outside that we have a process to actually make sure that we get outside of guidelines and get those pieces in quickly. And that's what's going to help with those forms um, being the correct forms and knowing the time in which they need to be complete. And I'm sure we'll get to it, but the third piece I think is also really critical is what we call provisioning. And that is getting them ready for day one and everything that needs to happen. And that can be a whole nother triad of if then statements that have to go into, into play to, to be successful through onboarding. Yeah, very good point. Uh, on, yeah. on the topic of provisioning, right? That is a massively disrupted um, process area now that you have to get computers to people in their homes and so on. Um, how, how are you seeing uh, the best companies do a really nice job of that uh, in, in your day-to-day -day experience right now? Uh, for me, the, the companies that are doing it up front, so the earlier the better, because otherwise you're just delaying a lot of other things to happen. It used to be, before we had systems to do this, we sent out that new employment box that had your coffee mug inside of it, might have had a hat or a t-shirt, it had your notepad and your pens, and in there was the binder of everything you had to fill out or bring with you on the day of start. So we did the, the full blown face to face orientation. So the quick lift and shift we have to do is figure out how to create that social experience, yet also get all those forms completed and have everything ready to go on day, day one. Now, the good news is very few organizations have everything ready to go on day one. So we can stage some of these in place, but the infrastructure that's needed the computer that's needed to be designed, plus the time for shipping, plus the plus the scheduled time for learning how to use the new machine with whatever company protocols there are. There are ways to just schedule each of these things to happen, but provisioning and making sure the right person in the organization knows which piece they have to do and how it falls within the bigger sequence and the cadence is a lot of a lot of design work that should be done um, in an in the virtual whiteboard today, and then a lot of if-then statements that have to be built in to make sure that it's going to be successful. So it's doing a few of the common and then starting to find the exceptions. So it feels a little bit like that's riffing off of what Chad was talking about earlier in terms of the AI and the ML and all that stuff can help, but it doesn't take away the, the hard work of thinking through what the experience is going to be like and how it's sequenced. Um, you, you agree with that, Chad? Yeah, but I mean, you do that up front. And, and if it's a salesperson, the salesperson is going to be equipped generally the same as, you know, there, there's there's a stock equipment checklist on what tech and whoever else needs to send something in that box. And I think that, you know, the coffee mug, uh, the, the coffee for the first day, you know, that kind of thing, maybe a t-shirt with their name across it so everybody can get the names right. Um, it's just, it, it's one of those things where, I've worked with, um, I've been in RPO and, and most of RPO is remote. They have that down because it's a business, yes. right? And they understand that being able to get that equipment out in very quick form, form uh, is, is necessary for the business. In HR, uh, in, in payroll, I mean, all the way through, we also have to take that same mindset. This is for business. We have to be able to obviously 
ensure that we are making them feel welcome on, you know, before day one, but we also have to get them up to speed and getting them into, I guess what you could call performance ready uh, set faster, right? So to be able to do that, um, there's no reason that you can't have all of that available and ready up front. Now, much like what Elaine was saying, if you have those those uh, forms for provisioned in the actual system, and I hit New Jersey instead of New York, the system should know to to give me the New Jersey the New Jersey form uh, to be able to go through the process that way, right? So again, you don't have to go pull it out give it you know it's it's one of those mundane tasks that we don't have to do as humans uh that we can just get rid of and allow technology to do that so that we can again back to the box which i love curate that box for every single employee that comes through so that they have a great experience pre first day all the way up through first day and beyond I'll add one last thing because we've talked a lot about those that are going to be virtual and there's still many organizations that are still hiring uh, people that will be on premise, whether it's in retail or in manufacturing. And I think one of the things that has changed the most there is how, how to proctor what to expect when you show up, um, especially with the safety protocols, especially with the health protocols that go into place today. There's a whole nother component of, of how to present yourself now in the work environment that we haven't really had to we've addressed it but we've addressed it after you've arrived at orientation you learn all of these things and now we're needing to learn them in advance of showing up to the facility to work so more virtual learning more virtual sharing that um, comes in a programmatic approach to make sure employees are ready yeah that's a very good point it used to be the 30 minute uh safety video right on on day one between nine and nine three exactly. which they can do online which they can right. do online before their first day. I mean, a lot of that content, and you can make it more fun, obviously. A lot of that content can be consumed and out of the way, check mark, and, and, and on to the next. Yeah, super. Um, I do want to encourage the uh, audience to submit questions. Um, we're happy to, uh, via the, the chat, we're happy to, to take any questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. We've talked a lot about um, the COVID impact and the remote workforce. We just touched on uh, the safety measures and so on. I think the other topic that's really dominating um, talent acquisition right now, obviously, is is related to social justice and um, diversity of the workforce. And I'm curious um, what you guys are seeing and hearing and thinking about um, how onboarding can play a part um, in uh, providing resolution and providing improvement for companies in that area. Either, either one of you, please feel free to <laughs> Chad goes like, first, I go 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 uh, I, I think I think this is incredibly important and I think we've we've seen uh, we've seen some brands take the lead on this from the uh, from the the standpoint of their black lives matter statements overall in 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 being able to support that initiative um, to be able to support that group I think it is important that we also, align uh, an understanding in, in rules for friendly discourse in the workplace because these things are going to happen they are they are important and we shouldn't suppress those conversations but we should put rules around how we interact with each other right so i think it's it's incredibly important but it could really deter people from our brand if they don't believe that they can come into work and they can be themselves. We, you hear every company say, we want you to come and bring your best self. Wait a minute, not if you're gonna talk about that. Or if you're not gonna do, well, wait a minute, I don't want that best self, right? So <laughs> companies and brands really need to understand that transparency is incredibly key, but we have to be able to put rules around how that narrative and how that civil slash friendly discourse happens. I always, um, I like to take the approach of, you know, uh, practice your brand and and brand your practice. So as an organization, we need to we need to stand up for what we believe is right. And as we're bringing in new hires and thinking about even the offer to the onboarding place, I'll start with offer and let's start with fair and equitable offers, not what fits within the band just because everybody else is low on the band. I got a little ball the offer. Let's, let's start to fix this first and foremost. We have the right to do this. We have the power to do this in HR. Let's start there. 
And then as yes. we move on, I think there's an opportunity, especially in that socialization piece, of really making sure that every employee feels like they're going to relate to and that their their values, their practice, their their life is going to add value to the organization. So bringing, whether it be that there are um, social clubs or events or activities, that they're being exposed to those things that are of value to them and have the ability to search on others, to find to find those that have different mindsets that they can come together and have conversations on. It's like it's like the employee meeting that we used to have where we could all, everybody showed up for uh, face to face in the, in the cafeteria for a, you know a couple of hours or those meet and greets with other employees, but we don't, we have to make all of those virtual and socialize via virtual now. So just creating more opportunity for that a community awareness and then also the community efforts out back to the back to how, how our company is represented to uh, the rest of the world. So the sooner we get new hires engaged in the way the company culture is projected and the activities that we're doing either through social justice movements or through um, giving back to the community or care, um, there are opportunities to really help that person really ingrain in with the company culture. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I also have started to see uh, several of the conversations I'm having with the employers that we work with where um, the offer to onboard process used to be you get the offer and it's like subject to a background check, right? Well, that is um, not necessarily uh, in alignment with meeting diversity goals and having an inclusive process, um, you know, given how, how some folks have been uh, adversely impacted, right? So we're starting to see um, the absolute upheaval of some of those processes that used to be um, the keys to, you know, the major events that happen in offer to onboard. And I'm wondering if uh, outside of like background checks, if there's other areas like that that you guys are starting to hear about in your conversations every day. I, I, think I don't know. One, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Saying, the one I see that changes the most lately has been more of the drug testing. Um, it used to be that we just did it for everybody for all reasons. And I think I see more organizations saying, no, it is, it's a specific area or a specific type of industry where it, there's some criticality to that because the definition of drug is state by state now and which, which components may have impact on that. So I tend to see that one changing the most. The background check as far as um, the education or the employment verification are typical, but even even the criminal checks and some of those other pieces are are no longer a baseline requirement for the job if they were if they were non-threatening kind of kind of effects. So we see adjudication um, of those background checks changing just a little bit on what equals qualified for the job just based on what the job requirements are going to be versus a universal no, which is what it used to be. Yeah, yeah I think a really good point for for all of the folks that are on the line to think. You know, there's a lot of companies that are really questioning and upheaving those processes that used to be sacrosanct. And uh, as a takeaway, you know, we can provide, uh, I certainly can provide from our customer base, other different examples of companies that are specifically doing uh, things like this that you can use for backup and opening up those conversations in your organizations. I think I just interrupted you, Chad, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say I agree 100%. Uh, with Elaine, it, it, the things that we were talking about pre-COVID were already issues. They're just bubbling up uh, much faster now, and, and we're seeing them. We're seeing the inequities in, in our system. Uh, so ban the box was there before. Now companies are really taking a look at, you know, what do we do to to, to prospectively ban the box? Um, what what really defending why a requirement a required background test or drug test is there you know that i think we should again go through the uncomfortable process of looking at all of that and questioning why we're doing what we're doing yeah completely agree okay so we just got a couple minutes left there's uh, with the wealth of experience that we have on the phone uh from uh, elaine and chad um, you know, what I would what I would ask is, what didn't I ask about? What is a hot topic of onboarding that I didn't even bring up uh, that you'd like to make sure you have a chance to share with the with the group listening? Well, I would bring up one is we we didn't spend much time on the offer part and the complexity that goes into defining the offer and then the parameters of the offer and those pieces. And I think it's such a huge opportunity to celebrate. Um, we oftentimes are okay. Well, here's the offer. Do you accept or don't accept? without really bringing forward, I think, the whole opportunity and the celebration of this 
because it is a, it's a big decision. So again, going back to how do we help this life event be something that is a positive experience overall, even even in the negotiations, nobody nobody wants to go through an offer negotiation. We don't, as recruiters, go yippee, the candidate wants to negotiate. Oh, well, fun. Um, and the candidate doesn't sit there going, ooh, great, I'm so excited I get to negotiate this because I want to fight for what I think is fair. And That's I think even ball. just yeah, even just how we approach that in um, the the conversation around money, the conversation around the benefits, the conversation around what to expect. It's such a delicate piece that we could just do so much better um, in just listening and just being compassionate, I think, on both sides of the equation. But as recruiters, it's our job to be compassionate first and to help the candidate better understand where there is room to negotiate or not. Um, oftentimes we are we are hopeful they just accept first and don't ask, but that's not Love the economy that. today. That candidates candidates are going to ask because it's a risk factor, and we have to we have to be able to to soften that risk. It used to be an availability of talent. Now it's a, a risk aversion. I, I really like that point, Elaine. Thank you for that. Chad, any other thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I think I, I think much like we've been fighting on the application side, and we still are. Uh, but also all the way through offer to, to to onboarding, we're taking 1990s process methodologies and we're trying to jam them into technology. Look at what we did, and which we really didn't do much of anything other than make it harder online, uh, maybe, or through email or what have you. We need to blow up our processes. We need to get the stakeholders in place. Much like Elaine said earlier, we need to have responsibility and accountability for all those different handoff points. What's going to happen, and much like I said earlier, <clears throat> going through onboarding, there's a process methodology that the hiring manager or the peer or whoever it is, is constantly getting engaged with the new hire, right? That touch point. But the system itself should be doing all the mundane stuff other than the, the human pieces. Um, if we do that, we actually have a chance to scale when we need to. And we don't we don't right now. We we couldn't scale for the most part. And and correct me if I'm I'm wrong, Elaine, if companies, if we actually flipped the switch on the economy today and we needed to scale quickly, the, the, the machine would break. We don't have enough people. We don't have the process methodologies in the system the way that they should be. And we're using technology like it was a fax machine. Right. And, and it is, it's an absolute truth because we've, we've gone about shut everything down versus how do we just slow things down? So it's slow it down, speed it up and working the gauge versus off or on. And you're right, the processes have such a huge opportunity to be redesigned for what technology does today, not what technology did before and just bring the old process forward to the new system. Um, I don't think there's anything more tragic in a system implementation than that alone. But um, we, should have, we should have processes that are designed around the new technology today. I could not agree more. I, I think uh, that's an excellent kind of topic to, for us to end on here. Um, uh, Elaine and Chad, thank you so much. This was super, super informative. Thank you. Um, it's so great to have your guys' expertise uh, here to share with our with our customers and our community. Uh, so I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Um, and hopefully we'll get to get to do it again soon. I've got a few uh, housekeeping notes I want to get through. So let me see if I can share my screen again. Uh, where are we? Hopefully I've got the right uh, screen shared again. Um, and uh, just walk through here uh, real quickly. Uh, keep in mind, if you wanna learn more um, about JobBite, you can get uh, that information at the, the jobbite.com website. Uh, lots of uh, additional information uh, on onboarding, on our uh, applicant tracking, recruitment, marketing, uh, software, product tours, et cetera. Uh, please do make, your, uh, uh, make that stuff uh, available to you and uh, go ahead and use it. We're super, super excited um, about our uh, session, the break room session on Friday with Jim O'Hare. Uh, Jim O'Hare is uh, Jerry, Larry, Gary from Parks and Rec. Uh, he'll be in in uh, speaking with Almond Brar, our CEO. Uh, super excited for that. And that's going to be really, really fun. Um, and tomorrow we've got uh, the demo days on our, our virtual onboarding experience product. 
um, and how all that works. And we'll be super excited to, to share that with you. Um, so with that, I'm going to I'm going to end it and invite you to go to the summer to evolve dot com and sign up for future sessions. And uh, really uh, pleased that everybody was able to hang in with us today and hope uh, you enjoyed the session as much as I did. Thank you.